Okay, I think we're set. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this event in the American Inspiration Series. I'm Margaret Talkett, the producer of literary programs at American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society. My colleagues and I, along with our partners at Porter Square Books, are delighted that you're with us tonight in the land of literature, sharing the history of our country and its leaders. On your screen is a schedule for this evening's hour-long program featuring author historian David S. Reynolds and his new book, Abe, Abraham Lincoln in His Times. Many of you have attended our virtual events before, but in case this is your first, a few housekeeping items. We are in a webinar format, which means your microphone is muted and your video is off. While we cannot take your comments in the chat box, we will share some relevant links in that space. We do want to hear from you, though, especially if you have questions for the author. You can send those in through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Some of you submitted questions when you registered. Thank you for those. They're great. If others surface as you listen, please enter them into the Q&A, and we'll cover as many as we can. Tonight's talk is being recorded by my colleagues here at American Ancestors, NEHGS, and will be published on the American Inspiration website in the weeks ahead. We'll share links to these pages tonight in the chat. Please, if you like what you hear and see tonight, signed copies of the book Abe can be purchased through Porter Square Books. You'll see on the screen that if you use the code AMINSP20, as in American Inspiration 20, um, use that as you order online or over email, and they will ship it to you for free anywhere in the United States. You'll see in David's presentation, there are some brilliant illustrations and photos. All of them are drawn from, from the book and you'll, you will wanna get this book, it's really remarkable. Um, a bit about our author tonight, David S. Reynolds is a distinguished professor at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Among his many published works is the book, Walt Whitman's America, a cultural biography, which won the Bancroft Prize, Ambassador Book Award, and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. His work, Beneath the American Renaissance, earned the Christian Gauss Award. He also authored the works, John Brown, Abolitionist, winner of the Gustavus Myers Outstanding Book Award, Waking Giant, America in the Age of Jackson, Mightier Than the Sword, Uncle Tom's Cabin and the Battle for America. And he's published as well, Lincoln's Selected Writings. Reynolds has also penned numerous essays and book reviews in the New York Times, The Atlantic, The New York Review of Books, and many other publications. My co-host David Sandberg and I, owner of Porter Square Books, we are really delighted to have um, Professor Reynolds with us here tonight. Um, welcome to both the Davids. Nice to be here. Great to be here. It's a, it's a thrill. We've been reading a lot about this book. You got some reviews, David Sandberg. That yeah. Well, thanks so much, Margaret. And we're also we're we're so happy to partner. Uh, on the American Inspiration series. Um, what we are saying before we got into the, the Zoom with everyone is one of, one of the few really positive things about this pandemic is it allows us to put an author who is not in Cambridge, Massachusetts with, uh, by my count, 415 people, many of whom are not in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, and so we really all get a chance to attend something that had we been in person would, would have been a lot more difficult. So there's that small bright side. Um, uh, we're, we're delighted. This is one of those books that is being talked about. And you might think, well, with by my count or by the New York Times count, over 100 books a year on average being having been written about Abraham Lincoln in the 155 years since his death. Uh, why this one? Uh, and I'll, I'll just quote Gordon Wood, who's a historian that many of us were reading back when we were in college quite a, quite a long time ago. One of the most eminent uh, scholars of American history said in his review in the Wall Street Journal that this book is, quote, a marvelous cultural biography that captures Lincoln in all his historical fullness, a big, wonderful book. I think that's a great place to turn it over to David. Indeed, I've Thank been loving the much, reviews, David and we're thrilled. And Margaret, great to be here. It's wonderful. Um, and talk about American inspiration, because uh, there's no one really more inspirational to spend a number of years with as I have. 
uh, in my research uh, than Abraham Lincoln. Um, I need not prove his greatness. I can refer to a poll taken about since World War II, about 50 different polls. And he's always uh, among historians, uh, you know, great, great, great historians. And he's all, he always makes either number one, well, his average is number one, but in a few polls, he's like number two or number three, but he, his average is, is number one. And uh, he, uh, it was just, just a joy for me to uh, spend uh, so many years uh, with him. And I feel very fortunate. My book is uh, quite different than the some 17,000 uh, other books on Lincoln because I spent most of my writing career as an author around Lincoln's and really beneath him, um, reading all the humor in the newspapers and uh, studying the pictures and the paintings and the songs and the this and the that. And I talk about all that material um, at some length in, in several early earlier books. So, you know, and Lincoln was always there as kind of what Walt Whitman calls the shining Western star uh, in his beautiful poem, When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloom. And he says, and he said, he doesn't mention the word Lincoln, but it's, a, it's all about Lincoln as, as the one great star on, in, in the Western sky uh, in the American landscape. And so he was always that way, but in a sense, he was a little too much on a pedestal. But then when I approached him from my angle, which in a way was from his own culture, I suddenly realized that there were so many incredible connections with that culture. So what I did is I went soup to nuts in terms of his biography from Log Cabin to White House. And, and uh, so I, I follow his biography, but around that biography, I, I, I wrap a kind of tapestry, which is his culture, because um, I write what I call a cultural biography. I try to revisit the actual times in which um, a person lived. So that some, in such a great book as David Donald's Lincoln, which is a wonderful, wonderful book. He, he says right up front, I'm only interested in uh, Link, Lincoln from his point of view. He had very, very little connection with his contemporary culture and society. Uh, he had less than one year of schooling. He entered the White House, uh, and this is almost like a direct quote, the least prepared president who ever entered the White House. And actually, my, my, my uh, biography actually says, if you want, want to think about it, exactly the opposite. Um, yes, less than one year of, of primary schooling. Um, uh, yes, he was raised on a, a frontier without many books and everything, but he had such a, an omnivorous curiosity about the world around him. So whatever books were there on the frontier, he would do anything to get them. He'd read them, sometimes he'd memorize them. He went to speeches, he went to sermons. Um, and Emerson, uh, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, the greatest thinker of 19th century America said, there's one hero <clears throat> who stands out for the range of his interests from the very highest to the lowest until the very dogs believe in him. That's Abraham Lincoln. And when you think about it, I mean, how many presidents have we had who can, for example, recite Shakespeare by the page? And he didn't do this to impress people uh, at cocktail hour or something like that. He, uh, these were passages that meant something to him. And when he read them, they stuck in his hard disk and suddenly they would come out in the middle of the Civil War and he'd be reciting Shakespeare. Or he could recite a very bawdy joke. I mean, it went all the, the whole cultural realm down to the dirty jokes, you know, he loved them too. And he liked everything in between as well because he, his favorite song was a real sappy sentimental song called 20 Years Ago. Well, who doesn't like a sentimental song, right? I mean, <laughs> 20 years ago. So um, yeah. He bridged the entire realm of experience. So no, no, he was not uh, detached, just the opposite. He ingested his culture. And I make sure when I re re write this book, I don't get lost in that culture. I'm always interested in Lincoln and his response, his interaction with that culture. And I'll give you a little taste of that today. Um, we don't have that much time, but, um, and <laughs> it's kind of a long book, but uh, what I'm doing, I'm 
explain the context of a few. There are, I think, 150 pictures in my book, all from that era, from that, that time. And I'm just going to uh, go over a few of those, explain you know, the context of them a little bit. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, there we are. Yeah, now this is um, the way Lincoln and the Republican Party was viewed by the South and by Democrats. Back there, the Democrats were the conservatives, Republicans were the, so what we would call the liberals. Anyway, uh, and so uh, basically it's chaos. Uh, and basically the North where the Republicans were is fundamentally chaos. Why? It's full of what were called isms, uh, spiritualism, women's rights, socialism, um, transcendentalism, uh, and the worst of all being, of course, abolitionism. Okay. Uh, that, that, that obviously was, you know, for, was, was by far the worst. So uh, this is what the North worship is, worships in the view of the Southern Southerners. Okay. Th this is what they worship. And there's an altar there in the middle uh, with various things on it. The, and at the very bottom, you can't really see it, but there's a little detail, but it says Puritanism is the very bottom stone. They believe that New England Puritanism gave rise eventually to all these evil isms that created a bedlam and a whereas the South was a wonderfully institutional place. You have the institution of slavery where uh, with a, a great hierarchy uh, where the white person where is where the white person should be, uh, uh, you know, uh, controlling uh, enslaved people, enslaved black black people, uh, and they tended to be a little more ritualistic in their um, sir, uh, religious services, and they really didn't have as many of these kind of radical isms. So, uh, from the southern perspective, this is what the North looked like, and going up from Puritanism on the bottom, which you can barely see, you see atheism, rationalism. Uh, well, it's true that uh, I wouldn't call the North atheistic, but deism, which was uh, basically what the founding fathers believed in, was kind of a rationalist religion, and it was a non-Christian. It, it was just reason, human reason. Uh, is being, and then above that, you see socialism, and yeah, utopian so socialism caught the fancy of some Northerners. And then to the left of that... Um, witch burning, they, they uh, associated that with Puritanism and, and with all these isms. Then you see spiritualism, spirit wrapping, that's getting in touch with the dead. And that was, that was quite popular actually in the North. Um, Mary Todd Lincoln was a spiritualist. She communicated with uh, her two dead children. He, she used to see them almost every night because um, they appeared. Uh, and then after Lincoln died, uh, there's a spirit photograph taken of her with the ghost of Lincoln in the background obviously photoshopped or what they didn't have photoshop back then but anyway uh and then next to that free love okay there were three free love communities one in ohio one in uh, on long island where i am right now and one in wisconsin and marriage was abolished and it was kind of a kind of like back in the early 70s these clubs where you go and you kind of you know have physical relations with people and all that stuff and then uh then you have uh, Negro worship, which is the very worst thing for a Southern person uh, to think about. And that was the top um, uh, tier there. And Lincoln's bust is above uh, a dying white person. And the idea there is that the guy that's holding the knife is Henry Ward Beecher. He was an anti-slavery abolitionist uh, preacher. And he's sacrificing a white, white person uh, for the God of the African American who's sitting on top of the altar. So it's the idea of killing a white person in sacrifice to the African American um, God who has a spear who is give, that was given to him. If you look to the left of his left of the African American, you see the statue of John Brown, who before the Civil War went down uh, to the South and um, gave spears to uh, the enslaved people to try to liberate them. Um, and then Lincoln, of course, is, is right there. I mean, one could go on. Uh, you can identify all the characters. There's Harriet Beecher Stowe kneeling uh, in the corner. 
Charles Sumner is there, um, Edwin Stanton, all, I'm not gonna go through all the characters, but anyway, it's the Republican party basically um, back then as we had, you know, by the Democrats or by the South. So next slide, please. And another shot of the isms, um, Horace Greeley, who actually was someone who was into most of the isms himself. He was into socialism, not in a free love, but into uh, socialism, abolitionism. Of course, he was the editor of the New York Daily Tribune, uh, women's rights. So, uh, and he's carrying Lincoln, who before he was elected did not have a beard. He did not have a beard. And Lincoln is looking back and saying, well, now my friends, I'm almost uh, in and the millennium is going to begin. So ask what you will and it shall be granted. And a woman says, oh, I feel such a passionate attraction for you. That's free love. And then a guy uh, next to her says, yes, and I represent free love too. And I expect to have free license to uh, carry out its principles. And then uh, someone says, oh, I don't want religion to be abolished and Mormonism to be uh, uh, made the stand Mormonism believe in polygamy and all that. And then you go back and then you have an African-American who's saying the white man has uh, no rights that colored persons are bound to respect. Uh, I want that understood. And he's reversing the Dred Scott decision, which actually said white people um, do not have to respect the rights of, of black people. So that this is a total reversal of the Dred Scott. Now the South su the, supported the Dred Scott decision uh, but this is a pro-Southern point of view. So they're saying, oh, look what's going to happen if Lincoln gets elected. This is going to ha uh, happen. There's going to be a racial, and then somebody asks, uh, else asks for women's rights. And then someone else asks for socialism and on and on. There's a whole crowd of these isms. And they're all headed for the lunatic asylum. Okay, next slide. So not only was the country divided, but it was kind of fragmented because um, even Lincoln admitted that the Republican party was made up of strands of, uh, it was on the ruins of the Whig party, which broke up in 1853. And then the Republican party was uh, built out of these many different strands. And he admitted that if you looked at them the wrong way, they could be viewed as a bunch of wild isms. So he said, look, we have to unify and he said, I'm gonna keep right in the center. And it was the center between the isms, uh, threading the needle between the isms, but also threading the needle between the North and the South. And he modeled himself to some degree, and he was often compared to, and compared himself to Blondin. Blondin was the great tightrope walker who went back and forth across uh, Niagara Falls. Uh, it's 1200 feet across and, you know, he went forward, backwards in chains on stilts, four foot stilts. He went pushing a wheelbarrow. He carried, the toughest thing was carrying someone on his back because, you know, the other person could shift his weight or something. There was no net. But so Lincoln was often portrayed in the other cartoon, for example, as Blondin, the political Blondin. And here he's carrying an African-American on his back because the racial issue, he had to really thread the needle on the racial issue. And he was attacked from both the right and the left. Uh, even members of his own party said, hey, you're much too conservative uh, on slavery and everything like that. He said, and as president, he said, you know, if I make this at the beginning an explicitly anti-slavery war, what's gonna happen is that we're gonna lose Kentucky or one of the other border, border states. Uh, then we're going to lose everything. We're going to lo lose the war. I have to be Blondin. And he said, if Blondin were crossing Niagara and pushing a wheelbarrow, he said this several times, would you tell him, step to the left, step more right, be more radical, be more conservative? No, you would say, stay right in the center, center to keep an equilibrium. Okay, next to slide. A couple of other uh, typical images of Lincoln as Blondin. Uh, the first one, again, about the sla slavery issue in uh, African Americans. The other one, uh, late in the war, he was called Blondin throughout the war, uh, where he was having trouble with his cabinet and one cabinet, Salmon Chase, who had been 
his competitor for the very good secretary of the treasury, but then he competed for the 1864 election. So uh, Lincoln actually had to fire him. So he's falling off of Lincoln's shoulders. And then there are a couple of grumpy cabinet members and Lincoln's pushing his wheelbarrow. And there's uh, the wounded African-American soldier below him and on and all the pressures on him, but he's still trying to stick to the center and keep the e equilibrium. And he would anger quite a lot of radical uh, uh, <laughs> beyond AOC or anybody who would say, uh, hey, why don't you be more radical in your anti-slavery uh, you know, thing? And he said, I really have to keep to the center. Otherwise, we're going to lose this war. We're just going to lo lose the war. OK, next slide, please. And another figure that I discuss is Barnum, P.T. Barnum. He was the father of show business. This was before he became involved in circuses. He would put on exhibit in his museum uh, people who were considered out of the ordinary at the time, small people, uh, large people, tall people, and also curiosities like the Fiji mermaid, who was this beautiful blonde, half-naked fish, uh, a woman and a fish. Actually, she was just a, that's what the posters said. She was actually a monkey's torso tied to a salmon's tail and suspended in water. But um, he was full of humbug and hoax, but people loved Barnum. And uh, this was one of his um, so-called exhibits, a small person by the name of, um, his name was a Stratton. And he came in, uh, he, he and his wife, they were both about two, two feet six and they came and shook hands with, with Lincoln. But Lincoln was often um, compared to uh, the, the one on the right, the exhibit on the right, which I don't know if you can see it. Uh, it was an African-American teenager that Barnum uh, presented as, what is it? He took the clothing off or left him in shorts and put him in a cage. And you were supposed to figure out that this was the missing link uh, between uh, the, the ape and human beings. It was a wild creature uh, that was caught in Africa, in Africa. And so people would come and say, what is that thing? Oh yeah, it's the missing link. And uh, it's a very, very repulsive, um, th th this was a teenage boy, very, very repulsive kind of exhibit, but uh, fairly regularly um, Lincoln was, was compared, like here he's saying, oh, how fortunate that this wonderful intellectual noble creature will be my successor successor in office. And there's Horace Greeley again and saying wonderful things about uh, what is it and we're gonna elevate what is it to the very top rung of the ladder, that kind of thing. Okay, next slide. And during the 1860 uh, presidential campaign, Lincoln didn't like the word Abe, he liked to be called Lincoln. But he said without the name Abe, I wasn't going to win that election. I, I wouldn't. The masses loved him as Abe, as Abe. And so even though he looked uh, like the photograph there, that's another uh, picture from the same year as the cartoon, uh, the masses really were sold by the rail splitter, uh, which is the way Lincoln had been many, many years earlier when he was splitting rails. Uh, they liked the folksy average everyday man image. Uh, they all, uh, he also uh, distributed this photograph because if one image made him look rural and kind of average everyday man, the other one made him look like a respectable lawyer, which is what he was. He was a politician. That's, that's actually what he was in 1860. So in a way, both images were part of the Barnum culture of, of imagery, uh, helping a candidate uh, become elected. Okay, next slide. I don't know if we have the next slide up here. Um, I guess we're having a little trouble with our next slide. Um, oh, she starts screen sharing. Okay, I think Trisha uh, lost her internet. So we're gonna wait a little bit. Anyway, it was so much fun writing this book. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is the third B that we had um, Blondin, Barnum, and this is the Bahois. The Bahois were the working class figures 
the butchers, the day laborers, and et cetera. They were all firemen because back then they didn't have uh, fire departments. So uh, there were volunteer fire come in. These Bahois would run to the fire and put it out. There were competing companies of Bahois and they would walk down the street with their gahals. And uh, there was a big competition among politicians to win the young American vote. And the Bahoy became a national figure, became the Ind Indiana Hoosier, the Illinois Sucker, that was the name of a fish. It became the um, Ro Rocky Mountain uh, Trapper, became the Wisconsin Wolver Wolverine. These were all nicknames of young people. And uh, Lincoln was known as both uh, the Sucker, because he was from Illinois, and uh, the Hoosier, because he lived in Indiana for a long time. So. Um, and he said, we have to win the shrewd wild boys, the shrewd wild boys. And he finally did. He, uh, because they gathered under his banner as the wide awakes. And there's another image there of the wide awakes. And they gathered usually at night with torches. We don't like the idea of, <laughs> of, <laughs> of torches at night. But uh, anyway, but this was for a very good cause. This is for Lincoln and for liberty, uh, for Lincoln and liberty and for anti-slavery. And they would uh, dress up in their oil skin, the coats and everything. So next slide, please. And one of the leaders of the boys was this young man named Elmer Ellsworth. And he was born, born in upstate New York, but then he went to New York City, finally Chicago, and he ended up in Springfield, Illinois and worked uh, in Lincoln's law office and campaigned for Lincoln. But he was also a military um, organizer. He loved to drill troops and dress them up in Zouave uh, uniforms. Zouave were Oriental uniforms uh, derived from French soldiers in the Crimean War. So he and his Zouaves would put, uh, put on acrobat acrobatic uh, feats throughout the nation. And Lincoln became very uh, admiring of him and said, there's nobody quite like Elmer Ellsworth. And he wanted Ellsworth to actually centralize the American army. At the time, the federal uh, army was very dispersed and it was a bunch of state militias and, and uh, Lincoln wanted him to organize them. And uh, he couldn't do it because uh, the attorney general shot him down. It was an anti-constitutional. But he went up to New York and gathered these troops, Elmer Ellsworth did, and he led them uh, down to Washington to help save Washington when it was endangered early in the Civil War. Okay, next slide. Okay, next slide. I guess Trisha, he was, um, Ellsworth was a diminutive, he was rather short, but he would come up to the toughest, most burly um, soldier and all his soldiers became his pet lambs. They, they just, he was incredible. He just had charisma. Anyway, so we're to the next slide now. And, but what happened, however, is that across from the White House in, uh, or in the distance in Alexandria, Virginia. No, 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 back to the other slide, please. Other slide. Uh, if we can get back to the other slide. Uh, there we are, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, there was a Confederate flag um, flying from a hotel and Lincoln could vaguely see, he didn't like the flag and um, Ellsworth didn't, none, none of Ellsworth or his pet lambs as he called his, his Zouab soldiers, none of them liked that flag. So they said, well, we're gonna go over to Alexandria and one of us is gonna go up and get the flag. So uh, he led them over to Al uh, Alexandria and Ellsworth says, I'm gonna be the one. And then he took an assistant. There's his assistant with a rifle there, uh, Brownell. And uh, they go up to the roof. They, uh, Ellsworth grabs the Confederate flag, stomps on it, comes halfway down. But the owner of the hotel meets him in the landing and shoots him. So there's Ellsworth who was shot and he's in a Zouave uh, Oriental uh, uniform and he's dying. And there's the Confederate flag under him. And the assistant is shooting and killing. His name was Jackson, not Stonewall Jackson, another Jackson, the hotel owner, he's shooting 
But Ellsworth becomes this huge martyr and he becomes fused in the mind of the North with John Brown. And that's why uh, the John Brown song was not only popular, uh, his body lies moldering in the grave, but also very, very popular was Ellsworth's body lies moldering in the grave, but his soul keeps marching on. So Ellsworth becomes a, and Lincoln was devastated by his death and wrote the parents uh, a very, very emotional letter. He, you know, he was like a son to me. Uh, you know, Elmer was like a son to me and he cried. He was uh, 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 interviewed by, by reporters and he just started crying. He said, yeah, I can't help it. Anyway, so Ellsworth becomes a tremendous uh, uh, impetus early, early in the war. Okay, next uh, slide. Next slide. Okay. And uh, just to go on until we get the next slide, um, a lot of the early Union regiments were called the Fire Zouaves after Ellsworth, the Zouaves. Okay, this was Lincoln's favorite humorist, David Ross Locke. And Locke idolized Lincoln. He met Lincoln during the Lincoln Douglas debates. He hated Stephen Douglas, who was this terrible racist person. And he had debates with the Lincoln and, and uh, Locke was a reporter reporter who came to all the debates and, and went to visit Lincoln. And they, they really got along wonderfully. And, uh, but a couple of years later, um, Locke started publishing under the name of Petroleum Nasby. And Nasby be, uh, came, became by far Lincoln's favorite uh, humorist. Uh, he used to carry Nasby's uh, sketches, uh, newspaper sketches around in his pocket and would recite them. He memorized a lot of them and would recite them at, at length. And several people after the death of Locke said, you know, there were three re reasons why the South lost the Civil War. The Army under Grant and Sherman, the, na the Navy, and the Nasby Papers. And it, not just one, but several people said, you know, the, the Nasby Papers. Why? Because Nasby impersonated the anti-Lincoln uh, people so powerfully. He impersonated this drunken lout who's a total racist, a copperhead. Uh, copperheads were Northern Peace Democrats who just wanted to make up with the South and accept slavery and all of that and, and uh, didn't like the war, didn't like Lincoln, wanted to kill Lincoln. Uh, and uh, in his column, uh, Locke would even say through Nasby, oh, it'd be great if I could just kill, kill Lincoln and all, all his cabinet. It's very, very acerbic humor. And even after Lincoln was assassinated, he said, well, a great uh, trait about Booth, a great he was about to say traitor. He said, no, no, I mean, Patriot killed uh, Lincoln. So he, even then he had to keep up uh, this pose of the anti-Lincoln pose, but it was like Saturday Night Live or whatever. It's like using political humor to uh, use a razor blade under your opponents and expose them for the ugly, uh, you know, people that they are. And uh, so, uh, uh, and, and Lincoln would really laugh at that. Uh, and a lot of people did, I mean, it was incredibly popular, this, this kind of humor. Okay, next slide. Now, Lincoln did definitely make progress uh, in his views of race. Early on in Illinois, he had to be a little more conservative and cautious because Illinois uh, was so conservative that it had what Frederick Douglass call, called the worst black law in the nation because of the law of 1853, which kept African-Americans out, free, free African-Americans out of the state. Uh, otherwise they'd have to either be thrown out or pay a $50 fine. So that was the kind of conservative environment that Lincoln, uh, um, he, he was fiercely anti-slavery, but he had to be a little cautious in his language. But then as president, he became increasingly more radical in his overt language. And finally, he became the first president to call openly for the vote for African-Americans. So he became, which for that day was very, very radical. And during the war, he met Frederick Douglass who called Lincoln the least prejudiced white person I've ever met, the least, least prejudiced. And uh, Sojourner Truth uh, 
a feminist African American um, visited him and said virtually the same thing. Um, you know, really, you know, uh, he called her Auntie Truth, and they discussed a lot of things. They discussed the Bible. She was very religious, and anyway, and then Martin Delaney, the third person, was almost beyond Black Lives Matter. I mean, he was, uh, you know, very mil militant. Uh, Afrocentric person, but he became very, very close to Lincoln toward the end of the war. I'm just showing that um, Lincoln's vision encompassed people of, of really all races and ethnicities. Uh, he had a little trouble with Native Americans at first, but then eventually he realized that a lot had to be done uh, for Native Americans. Unfortunately, the uh, people working under him during the Civil War were, were terrible uh, racists in general. And, uh, but actually he had adjudicated the case um, of those 303 Native Americans who were supposed to be hanged. And he brought it down to 38 because there was a big Sioux massacre out in Minnesota. And uh, at least, but he carefully went through every case and he said, no, 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 there's not gonna be 303 hanged. We, we'll, we'll have to execute only 38, terrible. but. Still, um, he did, a lot of people forget that he actually saved quite a lot of Native Americans. And Martin Delaney, after, after the assassination, uh, just bawled, he just bawled his head off and, and wanted to create a, a monument, a monument to Lincoln that would be an African, African woman um, crying, uh, crying millions of tears, um, you know, and, uh, so, and, and, and Delaney himself just cried. Anyway, next slide, please. And this is John Wilkes Booth, his father, Junius Booth. And Junius Booth was uh, Walt Whitman's favorite actor. And he was a great actor, Junius Booth, um, the father, but he, was, he went beyond method acting. He went well beyond method. Because if he was suffocating Des, Desdemona as Othello, he really almost suffocated. He had to be pulled off quite often. If he were Richard III in a sword fight, he uh, a couple of times went out in the street and pursued, I mean, he really got involved in, in, in the uh, role. And the one who really picked up this, um, his style, he had three major sons, uh, John Wilkes Booth, who's on the left. Uh, and then um, the middle one is Edwin. Edwin Booth was really a great actor and supported Lincoln. Junius Booth, uh, Junius Jr. was okay. John Wilkes Booth carried on the, the beyond method acting of his father. And, uh, once in a sword fight, he almost killed the guy and, and the guy was supposed to kill him. And so um, the guy said, John, you're supposed to die, 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 John. And when he tortured someone on stage, he really almost tortured him. And he really viewed, so his views of trying to kill Lincoln, with the, Lincoln had a whole file of assassination letters. So that was not unusual. So his view was not unusual. What was unusual is that he was an actor who really saw the whole, he killed Lincoln in a theater. He saw the whole thing as a stage play as a stage play and he, he was the great hero of the stage play. So basically he was carrying on what his father uh, sort of stood for. Okay, now I think that's the end of our slides and the end of my little capsule presentation, unless we have one more, I don't know. No, that's enough. <laughs> uh, I think you got the idea, the picture. So, you're muted, Margaret, you're muted, muted. Yeah. I've been absolutely loving the book and that was really fascinating. Thank so you, thank, thank you. you. For that. A, a little a scratch uh, uh, introduction, but yeah. Yeah, no, I really enjoyed that. And I, you know, having, I've been reading the book and, um, and there's remarkable passages leading up to where, where you started. Um, and we do have a question from the audience, which is what David and I are here to do is to give you questions from the audience about Lincoln's time in Springfield, Illinois. Um, the question is, what was Lincoln's life in Springfield as a young lawyer? My ancestors had a watch store near the state capitol. And there's some brilliant passages in that. So tell, tell us a little bit about Springfield. Yeah. So Springfield, uh, where he moves in 1836, when he's in his 20s, and he back then they didn't have law school, but he had read law books, and he became an apprentice and then a lawyer uh, with John Todd Stewart. Um, and then with Stephen Logan, then later with William Herndon. And uh, three different audit, um, uh, uh, law offices 
one on the northeast corner, then the next one on the southeast corner of the square, this is central square with the state uh, houses. And then the other one with Herndon, his third law partner was on the uh, middle west corner of the square to across the street uh, from the state house. So you've yeah. got a great map in the book, don't you? It's yeah, there's a map where you can see where every office is and where his home is and everything. Yeah. No, it was, it was actually wonderfully efficient. He could walk to his uh, his office, and you can, of course, now visit the uh, the museum, the um, Herndon Lincoln, uh, you know, law offices. And the thing about law in that day is that, unlike today, where somebody's, let's say, a divorce lawyer or whatever, or this kind of lawyer, a certain kind, of, he covered everything from homicide to lawsuits to women being battered. To sex, to to rape, to oh gosh, everything, everything, and so in a way, law really broadens his vistas to a great degree, uh, and he goes on the law circuit. Half the year he was off because the towns uh, around Illinois, the small towns, didn't have lawyers, so they needed lawyers to come to them. So Lincoln and all the other lawyers would go from town to town to town, and try all the cases, but it really expanded his mind incredibly. Yeah. It sounds like each of those three gentlemen he practiced with was politically, they were politically different, each of them. Yeah, they were. The earlier ones were rather conservative. And even though Herndon, the third one, had a few difficulties, he was not alcoholic, although ironically, he was very pro-temperance. He was very anti-drinking, but he was an alcoholic. But still, he was very temperamental. But however, having said that, he really was ardently abolitionist. I mean, ardently anti-slavery. And so he and Lincoln really would, you know, he and he got all the abolitionist newspapers and everything. And he idolized people like Theodore Parker, William Lloyd Garrison and everything. So Herndon was a real exposure to abolitionism. Yeah, yeah. David, you have a question? Yeah, sure. So um, actually I wanted to synthesize together a couple of the questions that came up in the chat asking you to go into the realm of uh, hypothetical, which is obviously Lincoln was killed just as the war ended. Um, but uh, I'm curious, or one of our, uh, a couple of our listeners were curious, based on what he had said during his lifetime about what his beliefs and plans were for reconstruction, how do you think it would have been different had he been there to supervise it during his second term until 1868 and potentially beyond. That was before the amendment that prohibited him from being president for more than eight years. But certainly in the immediate aftermath of the war, how do you think Reconstruction might have been different if it had happened under Lincoln instead of Andrew Johnson? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. Well, um, his plan for Reconstruction in the middle of the war was called the 10% plan, meaning that only 10% of a particular Southern state uh, of voters would have to uh, um, accept reunion with the North in order to be um, reunited. And that was considered very, very soft and much too cautious and much too conservative on the part of radical abolitionists. And so most of them uh, uh, believed in the 50, at least 50% uh, thing. Having said that, I think that if, if, because he was really progressing and shortly before he died, a couple of days before he died, he said, I really think African-Americans should have the vote. And John Wilkes Booth was in the audience and he said, that means citizenship for black people. I'm just gonna get, get rid of him. And he did a couple of days later, he shot, shot him. Uh, and he was very, very, uh, um, if we've all seen the Lincoln film by Spielberg, uh, very supportive of the uh, 13th Amendment, which was which abolished slavery. And he had such a sense of justice that had he lived, I'm certain that he would have continued to grow. Uh, as opposed to someone like Andrew Johnson, uh, he didn't select his vice president. Back then the um, conventions uh, chose the vice president, but Johnson had was a, white supremacist, and he, he didn't really care about rights rights for African-Americans whatsoever. So there was a brief period there where African-Americans did quite well under the radical Republican regime. And then there was Southern redemption and uh, 
pretty soon you had Jim Crow and, you know, until Brown v. Board, you have a long period of lynching and everything if of, of African Americans. But if Lincoln had lived, um, I'm certain uh, things would have gone differently, at least in the short run. He would have tried to really enforce the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment, which gives the vote to African American males. Whereas in reality, in the South, quite often the, the vote was suppressed, was suppressed through uh, uh, legally suppressed. So uh, yeah, he, he would have really been a much better shepherd uh, of the nation uh, in Reconstruction, for, for sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, in a passage I read today, um, you refer to the fact that he had said that he was gonna solve the Indian problem, the Ameri the, uh, uh, that he thought that there were a lot of injustices toward the Indians um, and that that was something he was going to take on. Uh, and I, I, it's fascinating that he referred to that too. Um, I have a question here from someone who wants your opinion on the start of the Civil War. Um, when did it start? Did it start with John Brown's raid or did it start with uh, Fort Sumter? Yeah, there was a series of events beginning in Kansas in 1856, the, the uh, battles, it's called Bleeding Kansas because there were battles between pro-slavery and anti-slavery people, including John Brown. Then John Brown raids Harper's Ferry uh, in 1859. But uh, the real start of the Civil War comes when Lincoln is elected because he's perceived, as you saw in some of the cartoons earlier, as a very, very dangerous person, someone who's going to cause a racial reversal in America and get rid of slavery and, and create a real nightmare for, for the South. Uh, and uh, when he becomes elected, then seven Southern states leave, leave the Union. They, they form their own country, the Confederate, with its own constitution, its own president, its own Congress, its own capital, everything. So, you know, and uh, yeah. And when that, and, and so Lincoln gives his first inaugural, seven states have left the Union. And he says, look, we have to be friends. We, we, <laughs> we, can't, we can't be enemies here, guys, you know. Uh, Let's think of those mystic chords of memory that goes go back to the American Revolution when we were fighting together. Come on, you know. But unfortunately, that didn't. And then um, a month later, uh, Fort Sumter in South Carolina was bombed by the. Uh, Lincoln said one thing: I'm not going to give up the federal forts in the South because that's federal property. Whatever happens, I'm not. I'm going to allow you to keep slavery but I'm not gonna sacrifice, that's federal property. And once the forts started getting bombed, that's when the Civil War begins, which is like April 14th, 1861, yeah. So maybe we have time for one more, one more question or maybe two, um, but following up from what Margaret just asked about, um, certainly from, from, for Lincoln, it was, the, the course was clear, partly because of the federal forts, but how, how seriously was the idea either by Lincoln or by the people around him considered after those seven states formed the CSA of the United States saying, okay, go ahead, keep slavery. Um, we're, not, we're not gonna enforce the Fugitive Slave Act uh, and blacks that wanna come North can come North um, but go ahead. Good luck to you. Was that was that ever seriously considered by Lincoln? Yes, as a matter of fact, um, as a matter of fact, not only did those uh, eventually eleven southern states leave the Union, but a lot of radical abolitionists like uh, William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, they said, "Yeah, yeah, let let the South go its own way. Uh, eventually, slavery will die of its own you know own accord." and the reason Lincoln um, didn't want that, or the Republicans didn't want that, was the following. Uh, if uh, the Western territories were taken over by s slave states, let's say, um, they would have representation in the US government. They'd be, each have two senators and a certain amount of representatives. Uh, they would pretty quickly, they already had I mean, 12 early American presidents had been slave owners, had been slave owners. So they, uh, and most 
uh, Supreme Court justices have been slave owners anyway, but this would really put the grasp of the nation uh, politically in, in the slave power. Not only that, but uh, the pro-slavery people really had their eyes on, on Cuba. They, they were pretty guaranteed they were gonna get Cuba and they had their eyes on Mexico and Latin America. So, I mean, slavery was something you, that had to be stopped, had to be stopped. It wasn't going to, because Southerner, Southerners at that time really believed that slavery was a divine institution. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing for, for both African-Americans. And they say we're the first moral ethical society that was ever formed on earth because we know where people should be in society uh, and Africans should be held in, in subjection. In subject. So they had the ideology of slavery behind them as well as states' rights and all of that. So yeah, that, that's why uh, Lincoln wanted to, to, to stop the spread. So I get a, I get a fun question here. Um, is it true that President Lincoln had pet goats that roamed on the White House lawn? Yes, there were two pet goats, Nanny and Nanko, Nanny and Nanko. And Lincoln became actually very attached to them. And he told um, his African-American uh, helper, uh, Lizzie Keckley, he said, aren't these the nicest goats that you've ever seen in your life? Aren't, the, aren't these the most gentle goats that you've ever seen? You know, <laughs> he really loved those. He also had a couple of cats named Tabby and Dixie. And he used to feed them from the table with a spoon. And Mary Lincoln didn't like the fact that he fed them from the table. But uh, the goats, I mean, the kids, the boys used to uh, um, tie the goats to chairs and put the chairs on the side and have them hauled around by ropes like horses. They would uh, use the goats as horses, you know, that kind of thing. So Those fun. boys had a lot of fun in the White yeah. House. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, they sounded, I mean, their parenting technique with them was completely laissez-faire too. Yes, yeah, I mean, Tad would, Tad would come into cabinet meetings and sit on Lincoln's shoulders in front of everybody and say, Dad, uh, because, um, Tad had a doll, Tad and Willie had a doll named Jack. It was a soldier and they executed the, the doll so many times they, that they for desertion uh, that Lincoln finally said, look, bring him in, I'll, I'll give him a pardon so you don't have to execute him. So during a cabinet meeting, uh, Tad brought him in and said, will you please pardon Jack? <laughs> he did, so yeah. Um, I have to ask one last question of David Sandberg, if you'll indulge me, um, because I work at this fantastic genealogical organization and um, several folks want to know about Lincoln's in-laws um, who were on both sides of the conflict. I mean, poor Lincoln with his split family. How did that affect his actions, um, his uh, relatives' influence? In the end, it actually helped him. And the reason it helped him was the following. His wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, was raised in a slaveholding family in Kentucky, kind of a wealthy family, and they had enslaved people and, and so forth. But um, her mother actually was kind of anti-slavery, and uh, her uh, siblings became anti-slavery, and Mary Todd herself became very, in the end, became very anti-slavery. And when the dad uh, remarried because the mother died, uh, the new wife, uh, the stepmother, um, was pro pro South, pro slavery, and the seven uh, the seven uh, half siblings of Mary Todd Lincoln, uh, all but one of them were very pro Confederate. Very very. In fact, um, three of them died fighting for the Confederacy. Another was was wounded uh, fighting for the Confederacy, and another one named Emily, who had been very very close to Mary Todd visited the White House and, and they, they, they loved each other. But then uh, a year later after her husband was killed fighting for the Confederacy, um, she, she asked uh, uh, Mary for money and she said, you know, I'm really mad at you guys because you guys have killed, uh, uh, you know, ki ki killed my husband and all these other people down South. And from that time on, Mary, even, even though Mary had been very, very close, uh, never contacted her again, so, you know, that, that was it. The reason it helped is that here he was married to someone who had been born into a slave a slaveholding family who defended him. And, you know, and, and when those people died that were her, her half uh, siblings, uh, he said, 
I cannot grieve. I'm sorry, I cannot grieve. If they lived, they were going to kill my husband and they were going to kill the anti-slavery cause. And in a way that sort of helped him because um, there were uh, newspaper articles about old Abe's Confederate relatives. And in a, in a strange way, it kind of kept him a little more on the tightrope, a little bit closer to the center than if he had been merely a radical abolitionist, you see? So in a way, it kind of smoothed the way uh, a little bit, yeah. Uh, so as is the tradition with this American Inspiration author series, um, we, we hear you have an ending reading for us, which we're really grateful for. And um, everyone out there, he promised me it would be somewhat inspirational because we all need that um, with soaring COVID numbers uh, and the like. So um, David, over to you. I think there's some slides here and, and thank well, you. There are some and slides. We'll so come back read, a little more. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to read a few passages um, toward the end of the book. An Illinois friend of Lincoln, Christopher Brown, said, Lincoln never went beyond the people. Lincoln's longtime law partner, William Herndon, said likewise. As a politician and statesman, he felt the popular pulse. And when he thought that the people were ready, he acted, and not before. As I've shown in this book, Lincoln did not go beyond the people because in his very soul, he was one of them. He knew them well, their, ta their lives, their tastes, their hopes. The people respected him, him as Father Abraham, but they loved him as Abe. Honest Abe, Uncle Abe, Old Abe. The nicknames were interchangeable. Average folk lined up to see Abe in the White House. He made regular visits to wounded and dying soldiers in the war hospitals. When the president visited a field hospital in Virginia in April, 1865, it was Abe whom the wounded soldiers recognized. A Pennsylvania soldier wrote, old Abe passed through on a shake hands with all of us patients. And he feed it, he shook all like 2000 hands. A New Yorker reported, uncle Abe gave each of us a word of cheer, a word of cheer. And just to skip a little farther toward the ending of the book, after Lincoln's assassination, the black abolitionist Martin Delaney, I showed him earlier, uh, proposed a monument to Lincoln, a kneeling African woman shedding millions of tears for the murdered great emancipator. Although Lincoln would have appreciated Delaney's tribute, he would not have wanted people to wallow in tears. He would have wished for them to take inspiration from his example and work together to create a more just future. That goal was captured in the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, designed by architect Henry Bacon and opened in 1922. Inspired by the Parthenon in Athens, the ancient seat of democracy, Bacon created a monument that represented Lincoln's devotion to national unity. It's 36 Doric columns, stand for the number of states in 1865. Its terrace is made of Massachusetts granite, the upper steps and outside facade of Colorado marble. Think about bringing the union together here, the union, the states. The inner wall, wall, walls and columns of Indiana limestone, the ceiling tiles of Alabama mar marble, and the Lincoln statue of Georgia marble. So he kind of brought everything together, uh, the, the architect. With its neoclassical columns, three inner chambers and huge marble statue of the seated Lincoln, who would measure 28 feet if he were standing. The memorial delivers a message of grandeur. It suggests Father Abraham. Next slide. But the statue itself gives a different impression. The tousled hair, the overarching brows and wrinkled hollow cheeks, the mole on the edge of the right cheek, the unusual lips thin on top and bulging on the bottom, the rumpled clothing and rough boots, size of 14 feet, <laughs> the oversized ears and hands and feet. This is the ordinary approachable Lincoln in a typical state of thoughtful abstraction caught expertly by the sculptor Daniel Chester French. This is Abe thinking things over and ready to burst out with a joke or a story or with an enduring speech like the Gettysburg Address or the second inaugural 
which are inscribed on the walls of the Lincoln Memorial. Next slide, please. The Harlem Renaissance author Langston Hughes memorably captured the spirit of the statue in his 1926 poem, Lincoln Monument, Washington. Let's go see old Abe sitting in the marble and the moonlight, sitting lonely in the marble and the moonlight, quiet for 10,000 centuries, old Abe, quiet for a million, million years, quiet and yet a voice forever against the timeless walls of time, old Abe. Martin Luther King's uh, I Have a Dream speech delivered before a quarter of a million people from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial on August 28, 1963 in the March on Washington. Uh, guided old Abe's voice toward the future. Five score years ago, King said, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln's decree came as a joyous daybreak for millions of enslaved people. But King went on to point out that since then, America had betrayed Lincoln's ideals. Injustice still prevailed. Lincoln, uh, King envisaged a time when, quote, all of God's children, black man and white man, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God almighty, we are free at last. Affirming national unity, King declared, with this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling, disc jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. Uh, that was Martin Luther King's vision and his interpretation of, of uh, Lincoln. These inspiring words bring us back to Lincoln. At America's most divided time, Lincoln pushed hard for justice while keeping the whole nation foremost in his mind. He progressed cautiously, shrewdly, inexorably, with honesty, with humility, with winning humor, winning humor, and in the end, with his thoughts on all Americans, regardless of party, relig religion, or race. His principled vision and his disarming modesty remain an inspiration to everyday Americans and political leaders alike. Freedom, equality, justice for everyone, even the most marginalized or oppressed, contained within one nation. This was Abe in his democratic fullness. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for for the book, for your time with us tonight. Um, and uh, as Margaret said at the beginning, um, David is signing uh, what pa what are signed books in this age of COVID are books with book plates um, that David sent us. Uh, and if you order them at portersquarebooks.com, that, that address that you see right there, um, and put the, uh, the American Inspiration coupon code in there, uh, they'll be shipped to you for free. Uh, and uh, I think Margaret, that's, all we want to part, but I just want to say, I'll just put in a little plug in case you don't find yourself in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Porter Square Books is a uh, independent employee owned uh, bookstore. Um, we do, we, we have a store that is even open now for a, for a few hours a day, but we're always online and we love doing things like this, uh, being a place for exchange of ideas where we can share authors with you uh, and we hope you'll, we'll see you again. Uh, David and I have another event coming up in the spring um, focused on the Civil War and uh, Walt Whitman and others. But um, coming up in the next couple of weeks, um, driven by our love of history and stories, we'll be presenting more of these author talks. Um, on December 7, which is next Monday, we're going to focus on a contemporary of Lincoln's. Um, they're actually born two years apart. Uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, uh, Mary Todd Lincoln, um, entertained him in the White House. 
Um, there's a great passage about that. Um, we're looking at him and also at his intellectual partnership with his powerhouse second wife, Fanny Appleton Longfellow. Authors Diana Korzenich and Nicholas Bassbanes will discuss this new work, Cross of Snow, in a WGBH Forum Network production with our partners at the State Library of Massachusetts. Um, we did a quick rehearsal yesterday, and both of these authors are fascinating. Um, and so were Fanny and Henry, who lived in what some call Camelot on the Charles River um, here in Cambridge, Mass. On December 16th, we take off for Texas to examine the life of Bonnie, as in Bonnie and Clyde, Christina Schwartz, the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Drowning Ruth, is going to be in discussion with the LA writer and comedienne uh, Sandra Singh Lowe. They're going to be talking about Christina's new book, Bonnie. Um, the book has a good number of Christmas scenes in it, which should make for a really merry discussion. Um, and looking to the year ahead, something not so merry, uh, on July 13th, we're going to be looking at the 500-year history of hurricanes. Um, presenting um, New England's best love historian, Eric J. Dolan, with his latest work, A Furious Sky. Uh, meanwhile, back to today, to 2020, um, please know that all of us here at American Ancestors, our doors, our virtual doors are wide open to anyone looking to research a figure such as Lincoln or their own family history. Um, you can connect with our genealogists on the phone, on Twitter, through our website, AmericanAncestors.org, you'll find downloadable research guides, free educational resources. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and connect. And for those of you steeped in the 19th century, um, as we are this week, um, you can visit digital.americanancestors.org to explore historical family and personal papers, military records, town and government filings, church records, and other unique primary source documents that can inform your research. You can also search for people in our online database through all sorts of records you see listed here, um, from birth to death and from everything in between. And um, because it's the Christmas season, in addition to the A book, um, do think about giving gift memberships to our research center. The details are on the screen and memberships start as low as $35. Um, you can sign up online or be in touch with these wonderful folks who work in our membership office um, over the phone. They're there all the time. Um, however you want to join us, even if it's just for these free events, these fascinating author talks, um, we will hope to host you again virtually. Um, for now, our thanks to tonight's great, remarkable author and this inspirational talk. Um, David Reynolds, we wish you and Abe well in this holiday season. And thank you, David Sandberg and everyone at Porter Square Books for your co-hosting tonight. And to all of you out there, we wish you a safe and an inspirational evening. Thanks for joining us and have a good night.